our agenda, we're going to uh, start out with just uh, an overview, give you the top level uh, view of what the uh, microstation looks like. Then I'll go into a little bit more of a product tour, then uh, getting into some of the features and specifications that, that might be relevant to your decision, and then a little bit of positioning within the Hobo Station product line, talk a little bit about sensors, software, and some, some applications information. And as I mentioned, there will be a time for questions uh, at the end for anything we don't cover during the, the presentation. I suspect most of you uh, are familiar with, with Onset uh, already, but if you're not, uh, just a, a little bit about us. Uh, we are a world leader in, in data loggers, especially in the fields of environmental monitoring. We were founded back in 1981, and we're at about 130 employees. Um, and we're all located here at this facility in Cape Cod, Massachusetts in the US. Uh, you can see we've got uh, a bunch of solar panels on our roof. We uh, uh, get a good percentage of uh, uh, of our power uh, from these solar panels, and uh, trying to be as green a company as we can. Um, and our sole focus uh, is on data loggers and monitoring, and we have a worldwide network of distributors to uh, help support you wherever you may be in this world. So I'm going to start out with a little uh, question just to get you guys all involved. So, and it also helps me to get a sense for uh, uh, your background. So the first question I have for you is, uh, what data loggers have you been using? And let me call up the screen to uh, show you what the choices are. And I ask uh, for you to check all that apply. Uh, if you've got experience with our microstations, for example, uh, check that first box. So there's a few choices. And I'll give you uh, oh, 15, 20 seconds to, to read through the choices and check what's appropriate. All right. Looks like we're starting to see some trends. That's good. So I think I'm going to close this, and you can see for yourselves uh, kind of where you uh, uh, fit in. And uh, looks like the majority of you, uh, two thirds, have used uh, Hobo data loggers. So that's that's good. So you'll be familiar with our our uh, our software already. And um, a little over a third of you have used um, our station loggers, either the weather stations or the the micro stations. And, um, so a lot of this will be review for you, and uh, we also have some that have not used our data loggers before. So that's uh, uh, I'll go into a little bit of details, hopefully uh, uh, to get you a little more familiar with the Hobo data loggers. So I don't know if you. No. I just realized I hadn't clicked the right box. So now you can see the uh, the results. Let's see. So now continuing on with the, that background, let me give you a little overview of the, the new USB microstation. For those of you who have used our other microstation, you'll recognize this. This is our old microstation. And as you may remember, uh, you had to use our um, USB to serial converter cable if you wanted to plug that into a USB port, or you could just use a serial cable if you had a serial port in your computer. Not many of those serial ports around. To develop our new microstation, we took basically the, that USB converter, took our microstation, put it into a blender, and out came our beautiful new Hobo USB microstation. So that's conceptually what it does. Let's see. Oh, I see. Thank you. I got some feedback that you're still seeing the survey data, and I forgot to show you the uh, the nice little slide. So now you can see what I was talking about with the combination of the uh, old microstation and the USB converter. Thanks for that uh, that input. And let's um, continue on. Here we go. So 
at the high level, it's a nice compact, uh, fits in your hand uh, station that has five smart sensor inputs. It has a hinged door, uh, which makes it easy to install the uh, sensors. Well, we're selling it for a price of 220 US dollars with the alkaline battery, so it's actually less than uh, our previous microstation. And this will replace our current H21-002 microstation. We, we think that most of you will want to migrate over to uh, this new station. So let me give you a little tour. So here's uh, what it looks like with the cover open. Uh, it is a uh, IP66 uh, rated enclosure for long-term reliability in harsh environments. We know a lot of you are deploying these in, in jungles or in Arctic regions where uh, you really need the, the highest possible uh, reliability, so we designed a very uh, robust enclosure. Uh, it's a hinged door, so um, uh, you know, it stays in place you know, as you open it up. You don't have to worry about any parts coming off. And it does have integrated mounting ears for mounting it with screws, zip ties, or U-bolts. So there's no need to order a separate uh, mounting kit uh, at this point. It's uh, powered uh, by four AA batteries, and those will, in most cases, provide a uh, one-year battery life, assuming a one-minute or longer logging interval. It's got some status LEDs that tell you things like uh, your battery status and sensor activity and if the logger's running. Nice confirmation that uh, everything's okay. And uh, it has a start button so you can set it up in the office and then take it out into the field, plug in the sensors and start it in the field. And it has uh, five smart sensor inputs. And uh, one of the key features, it's got a built-in USB interface. So you just plug in an ordinary USB cable to connect it to your computer now. For the cable entry, it has a uh, special rubber gasket. I'll show you a, a couple different views on that in the following slides. Uh, that's uh, one of the keys to providing a weatherproof seal around the cables. And it does have a latch uh, for a user-supplied padlock, or sometimes people just put a zip tie through that. It provides it a, an added degree of security to keep that uh, enclosure uh, latched, closed. So uh, like our other station loggers, uh, it has uh, smart sensor inputs. This is, uh, means that it's very easy to uh, uh, install any of our smart sensors. You just plug them in, they, they latch in place, and then it has a little uh, tab that you push down if you need to remove those uh, sensors uh, at a later time. Uh, it's proven to be a very reliable, secure way of attaching sensors. Then it's got this uh, cable gasket. Uh, this is what it looks like when it's uh, the door is closed and uh, the gasket is sealed up around, in this case, four sensor cables. Um, there's slits in the top of the gasket that uh, make it easy to slide in the cables uh, from the top. You have to actually bend up the, uh, the gasket a little bit to, to, to slide the cables in. And then when you close the door, it compresses that cable gasket down around those, those cables, so it makes a nice weatherproof seal. It's hard to see in this picture, but there's a rubber filler plug that's uh, in, installed in the, the fifth sensor cable hole. Uh, and that's how, if you have less than five sensors, you use those um, filler plugs to, uh, to fill up the unused uh, holes. Talk a little bit more about mounting. Um, it's got these inner slots that can be used for the included zip ties for mounting it on a uh, pole, mast. Uh, it, it seems like we use zip ties for everything uh, for mounting these days, and they're uh, quick and easy to install on the field, so that's easy to do with this, this logger. It's also got these outer holes, which are for uh, one and a half, or I'm sorry, one and five-eighths inch U-bolts 
uh, which is an option that, you know, that we sell as an accessory for these, or you can use those holes for uh, mounting the logger to a flat surface with screws that we include. Uh, Onset uh, also offers a range of masts and tripods that uh, can be used to mount this, or uh, we found that uh, many of you are ingenious in coming up with uh, PVC pipes or fence posts or those T-type fence posts for, uh, for mounting loggers, and you can uh, easily zip tie this to, to any of those uh, posts that you may come up with. So let me go through some of the features, and I'm going to uh, compare the features to what the H21-002 had. Just to, for those of you who are used to that, it'll give you a sense for how it compares. So let me point out uh, uh, some of these features. First, looking at communications, uh, of course, the, an obvious difference is a serial interface versus a USB interface. Uh, five smart sensor inputs versus four smart sensor inputs. It still uh, has the same 16 channel limit that our uh, previous micro stations and, and weather stations have. It's got, you know, it's got that same uh, limit on the number of, of channels and that's because some of our sensors have multiple channels on one sensor. For example, a temp RH sensor uses two logical channels in the logger, so that uses two of those. Uh, 16 available channels. Um, in terms of the mast mounting, uh, for the old microstation you had to buy the separate mounting kit. Now that's built right into the uh, the logger so there's no need to to add that, uh, that mounting plate um, and there's no need to purchase an extra mounting plate. If you do want to mount it with U-bolts, we sell a U-bolt kit for six US dollars. If you're going to mount it with zip ties or screws, those are included. Uh, the log we do have adapters for our smart sensor bus for connecting sensors that have a voltage uh, or a 4 to 20 milliamp output. Um, you know, it's a low level DC voltage. We're talking about 0 to 2.5 volt uh, output. Those um, uh, can be connected with these adapters. Uh, one thing to note is those adapters won't fit inside the, the new microstation enclosure because it's a pretty you know, small, compact enclosure. So if you need to add these adapters for connecting other sensors, you'll need to buy the expansion box, the S-Adapt-6 expansion box. Um, in the case that you might need a grounding wire, um, that is an extra uh, accessory. Um, and it's a, different part number than the, the ground wire that was used with the old H21-002 microstations. And this ground wire is needed as if you're using any of our wind sensors or, or if you're mounting it on a metal tripod or mast, we recommend using that grounding wire as well. Let's see. Oh, I did skip over the uh, operating range. Um, because that's the same for the new microstation as well as the old microstation. And how that works is with the standard alkaline batteries that we include, that's uh, rated for minus 20 to 50 degrees Celsius. And if you buy the optional lithium batteries, then it can go down as low as 40 degrees Celsius and up to 70 degrees Celsius. So um, a pretty wide uh, operating temperature range, uh, especially with those lithium batteries. The uh, next thing I'm pointing out here at the bottom is another thing to note is the new H21-USB is not actually supported by our Hobo shuttle. So I know some of you may have been using that. If you want to offload data in the field, uh, you will need to, to bring on a laptop uh, computer or offload the, the, uh, the data. We support both Mac and Windows PCs or laptops, but you will need to bring one of those into the field for field offload. Some other specs, uh, logging interval, uh, and then these are the same for both versions of the microstation, the old and new. Uh, logging intervals can be between one second and 18 hours. Many start modes, uh, the memory, it's uh, about half a megabyte of non-volatile flash data storage, which uh, is enough for a year uh, of logging with five sensors at a 10 minute logging interval. 
And as I mentioned before, it's a one-year battery life. And that's, again, with, you know, fully loaded five sensors and a one-minute logging interval. Just uh, to position this within Onset's line of station loggers, because we do have a few different choices. This is our kind of lowest cost entry level station at 220 US dollars uh, with five inputs. Uh, you can see next to it is our U30 NRC station, which has uh, options for 10 inputs. Uh, the price for that is, is somewhat more at $607 with a, a solar panel. So that's you know for slightly larger, uh, more you know longer term applications where you just want to have it solar powered so you don't have to replace the batteries. Uh, for uh, applications where you want to get your data through the web or you want to get alarming capabilities, uh, there's the RX3000 remote monitoring system available that uh, uh, also has a choice of five or ten inputs. In terms of uh, communications options for getting that data onto the internet, you can use cellular, Wi-Fi, or Ethernet. And the the pricing on on those stations starts at just over a thousand dollars, including the solar panel. All of these stations use the same set of uh, smart sensors uh, and allow up to 15 channels. I, I think I actually said 16 channels before. I should correct myself. That I meant, meant to say 15 channels that are supported with our smart sensor bus, a wide range of plug and play smart sensors which are compatible with all of these stations. And we try to provide uh, you know, excellent research grade performance at a reasonable price across all of these. Let me talk a little bit about the uh, sensors. Again, those that have used our stations are probably familiar with our range of sensors. Um, so pardon my uh, uh, repeating uh, information that you might already know for those, but for those that aren't familiar with our line of sensors, uh, let me go through these quickly. Uh, I've broken these up into smart sensors. We're covering your, your kind of your standard weather and climate parameters, including soil moisture, um, temperature, R, temperature RH, and you, you can read the, the list, and I'll actually uh, show pictures of them in the following slides. And as I mentioned before, we have options for sensor adapters. We have two types of sensor adapters, actually. We have a, a pulse input adapters, which can be used to connect other rain gauges. You know, maybe a, you want to use a really high-end rain gauge um, with, uh, you know, that can work in, in uh, freezing conditions, for example. Uh, we have pulse input adapters that allow you to connect those. And uh, other sensors that you might connect to pulse input adapters are flow sensors and kilowatt hour sensors. And um, one thing to note with the pulse input adapters is those do not require the expansion box because those uh, have, you know, the, the adapter is already in a weatherproof housing. On the other hand, if you're connecting voltage sensors or sensors with a 4 to 20 milliamp uh, output, uh, you will need that expansion box that I mentioned before. So, so here's just some pictures of the sensors, temperature and temp RH sensor. The, the temp RH one's the, the, the lower one on the left. Um, the temperature only sensor is waterproof, so it can be used in, in water or soils. The, uh, that little adapter housing that's in the cable, that is not waterproof, so you don't want to have that part of the cable underwater, but the rest of the cable is. Um, the uh, temp RH uh, sensor is um, the actual sensing element is user replaceable if you've got an especially harsh application uh, that's kind of a, um, a nice feature to know that you can replace that every year or so if, if your sensor is found to be deteriorating and if you're using either of these sensors outdoors we recommend that you use our solar radiation shield the RS3-B uh, to protect it from sunlight so you can get accurate uh, temperature measurements for rainfall, we have a couple of choices. We have the uh, uh, the, the high-end S-RGA uh, and RGB rain gauges. Uh, those come in an aluminum housing. Um, uh, that you can see the the, um, the sensor up on top. It's the most robust, the best accuracy. Um, and then we also offer the uh, the, the lower cost. Uh, it's, it's actually a Davis. Uh, rain gauge that's a, a, a plastic rain gauge but still you know a good reliable rain gauge at a, at a, at a more affordable price um, 
in both cases, you can buy it either in a, uh, a 0.1 inch or a 0.2 millimeter resolution. Um, you know, we recommend you mount these on a post near the ground or, uh, or in some sort of stand near the ground for the best accuracy. But if you're going to mount it higher up on a mast, make sure to use guy wires so you don't get any faults, uh, rain triggers, and windy conditions. Uh, we have a range of wind, speed, and direction sensors. Again, you know, for kind of your basic uh, low-cost sensors, we offer the Davis uh, wind sensor uh, you know, with, a, with a smart sensor adapter on it. That's our, our lowest cost. Uh, we've got our kind of tried and true, most robust, uh, good performance uh, wind sensor set, which uh, actually consists of these two sensors, and we sell a cross arm for using those, so you get good sensor spacing for better performance. And then for those of you who need uh, even higher end performance for your uh, wind measurements, uh, we have RM Young adapters. We actually, add, I think, have four different adapters for different models of our RM Young wind sensors. We sell the adapters for 150 US dollars. Uh, you buy the wind sensors from RM Young or one of their distributors. Uh, we also have a barometric pressure sensor. Uh, soil moisture, we uh, resell the, uh, the Decagon uh, sensors. We sell the, uh, uh, these two models. The S-SMC is um, you know, the, a smaller sensor. That's uh, good if you're doing multiple depths or you're measuring in tight spaces and greenhouses or pots. It's also what we recommend for, for non-mineral soils. Um, for a bigger volume of influence, we sell the S-SMD sensor, which is based on Decagon's 10HS sensor. This is useful if you're trying, especially for irrigation, where you're trying to get a uh, kind of a, an average over more of the soil, or if there's a vari variation in the soil, uh, then that's what we recommend then. Okay, here's an interesting question. Uh, thanks uh, for, I always like questions, um, is, uh, you know, uh, Somebody observed that the wind sensors uh, that we sell, the onset wind sensors, have two outputs, um, while the Davis wind sensor has a single output. Um, that's um, uh, largely because of, of how those sensors are set up. The, uh, uh, the Davis sensor has the signals for both the wind speed and the wind direction integrated into that one sensor cable that comes out of those sensors. And we have one adapter which takes uh, those signals, converts them to uh, our smart sensor bus so that you can see the, the data in miles per hour and degrees uh, relative to north. So um, they were able to offer one connector which provides those two parameters. And it actually also provides wind gust. Um, so it actually provides three parameters from that, you know, the one sensor. With our wind sensor set, um, there, you have a little more flexibility. You can certainly use both of them together for both wind speed and direction. And in the case of wind speed, you're going to get wind speed, plus you're going to get the, uh, the wind gust from the, the one sensor, and then you're going to get the wind direction from the other sensor, and it's going to give you a unit vector average of the, uh, the wind direction, again, in degrees. And so that does mean that if you buy the wind sensor set, that requires two inputs on your microstation logger, whereas you've, if you buy the Davis wind sensor, you only need one input on your, um, uh, on your, your station logger. So kind of the choice, choices you, you have, um, uh, but, but a good question. Light sensors, we sell light sensors in two flavors. Uh, one is for solar radiation. Uh, and that sells for 210. We also have a PAR sensor. Uh, the two sensors look identical, basically, and they use the same light sensor bracket. Um, and well, the PAR sensor is for uh, uh, measuring uh, uh, photosynthetic light relative to plant growth. All the solar radiation is is is, a, uh, is calibrated for total uh, solar radiation uh, in sunlight, and is really intended to be a measure of uh, sunlight outdoors. And the bracket does include uh, screws for, for leveling that because it is important that the light sensor be leveled. So that's a quick tour of the, um, 
uh, sensors. Uh, yeah, I just had a question. Can you uh, uh, repeat the uh, the PAR comments? So just uh, kind of reiterating, PAR stands for photosynthetically active radiation. So PAR is a measure of the photons of light that are uh, in the, um, the 400 to 700 nanometer uh, range. And that's uh, really important if you're looking at uh, plant growth. Uh, so that's why we, we offer that sensor specifically for that. Uh, whereas if you're looking for heating effects or evaporation effects, that's where the solar radiation sensor will be more, uh, more useful. So hopefully that helped to, to clarify that question. So um, now I'm going to switch to the software. So first we'll look at the uh, software used to set up the loggers. And again, if you've used uh, any of our station loggers or if you've used our standalone loggers, uh, it's, this is our HoboWare software, so it's pretty much the same software. So let me just point out um, uh, some of the features of this. So because they're smart sensors that are used in this logger, as soon as you plug those in, the logger automatically recognizes what kind of sensor is, is plugged in. So in this case, uh, a soil moisture sensor was connected. And so it shows that there, and it will that means it will display the data in water content, in um, volumetric water content, meters cubed per meters cubed. So no programming necessary to get that data directly in that uh, in those units. Um, you can add um, sensor labels. You know, for example, if you've got multiple soil moisture sensors in your system and you want there are different depths in the soil, you can easily add sensor labels as shown here, such as at 30 centimeters, and then we have another soil moisture sensor that's at 60 centimeters. And then the other thing you need to set up is the logging interval, or logging rate, and the start time. You can have a start right away, or you can set, set it up to start at midnight tonight, you know, using our uh, delayed start feature, so you, you set that up here. That's really all you need to do to um, uh, set, up the, set up the logger to begin logging. The, um, uh, you can also set up the uh, location at the top, which is or a name for the stations, especially if you've got multiple stations. You probably do want to set up a, a name for your station that, that identifies uh, uh, the station as unique from the others. Um, yeah, there's a uh, yeah, I see a question on HoboVware Pro versus the free version. I'll, I'll address that in a couple of slides, so that's a good good question. And one of the things about the uh, the software too is you can use this to confirm the current readings of the sensors. So you see a button here that says status, kind of up here in this area. If you click on that, that'll bring you. Whoops, I forgot one other note here at the bottom. I'll, I'll talk about status in a second. I also want to mention. A couple notes about using uh, the the HoboWare software, the new microstation, the new USB microstation, is because it still has a kind of a, a USB to serial converter inside it. You still need to select a device type USB and serial devices. So uh, there's a note of caution um, to make sure you do that when you're configuring your preferences in the uh, HoboWare software. And the other thing is you want to be connected to the internet the first time you connect a Hobo USB microstation because it's going to automatically download the drivers for that microstation, but it needs to get access to the internet to get the latest versions of those drivers. So just a couple of little cautionary notes as you're first uh, setting up your loggers and the software. So now here's the, uh, the status screen. So this is just a quick way to verify uh, the status of your uh, your microstation as you're deploying it. You can view this as you're uh, deploying the logger before you actually launch it um, to see the current readings. Make sure your sensors are giving you re reasonable readings uh, for 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 your environment. Like you know, check the temperature is reading accurately for for where the sensors are. Um, you can also look at the status screen during deployment at any time you want during the deployment. You can. Uh, check the status just as a confirmation that everything's going okay. And again, you'd need the a, you know, a laptop computer uh, out in the field to uh, to, um, uh, to 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 use use the software to uh, to check the status. 
and this is after you've deployed the loggers, you've uh, read out the uh, the data from from your logger. So to read out the uh, the data, you, you can use this little icon here. This is the readout icon, or you can go up to the device menu and select readout. There's a couple different choices for reading out your data. And you open up your data file, um, and here's uh, here's a typical uh, typical plot uh, showing the data. And just some features about this is uh, the software will allow you to combine data from multiple loggers onto one graph which is important, especially uh, if you've got multiple loggers. A lot of times you want to see what's happening at one spot in your field versus another place in your research field at the same time and, and compare and contrast. And so you can do that easily by basically copying and pasting uh, data series from one uh, uh, data logger to another and combining them. And you can save that as a project file uh, that combines, you know, the data that's of interest. Uh, you can also annotate points of interest. You know, got a rain event here, which led to an increase in soil moisture, and it's very easy to export the data from these. All the data that's in the current view uh, will be exported. It's, it's a basically a, um, a one click to go to the export screen, just to confirm where you want the the, the data to go. Um, the other thing I want to mention about the, um, let's see, I think it's on the next screen, yeah, for, for data export is you can customize how the data is exported. You can you know, set up the uh, date format for the region that you're in, data separators, 12-hour versus 24-hour times. So the advantage of this is if you're exporting it to another program that you're using it with consistently, you can export it in a format um, uh, that can be used by that program very easily. And you just set this up once in the preferences uh, in your Hoboware software, and then it will use that as your default data export format from then on. So, um, you know, that's a, a feature to be aware of. So you're not having to, you know, you know, set up that each time you export the data. You set it up once, and then it, then you've got it from there. So. Uh, yeah, I think I saw a question on this. Hoboware, uh, we offer two versions of Hoboware. There's a free version that you can download uh, via the web. Uh, anybody can download that. And then we have a pro version, which uh, we sell for $99 on CD with the, uh, the USB cable, or uh, we sell it as $75 as a, as a web uh, download. So both versions provide uh, full setup capability, data download, graphing, data merging, and export functionality, basically all the things that I just talked about. The pro version adds some additional functionality. Uh, it adds some uh, setup and readout time savings features that are useful if you have multiple loggers. You want to make sure you set them up all the same way or, or export them as a, as a bulk export. It's just it's some features that save you some time. Uh, the pro version will allow you to import data from other sources, combine it in with your uh, hobo data so you can look at it in our software and, and um, uh, just merge that data very easily. The pro version also supports data assistance for calculations such as growing degree days or kilowatt hours. Uh, we do have, you know, that's more for the folks in the energy space, but we do have some uh, sensors that can be used with this microstation for monitoring kilowatt hours. Um, the pro version also allows you to, to crop data, which is useful if you want to uh, eliminate extraneous data uh, that might have happened when you were uh, transporting the logger out to a site. That, you know, it's just data inside your car, for example. You you might not want to have that data as part of your data file. You can easily remove that with the cropping tools. And um, there's also a subset statistics tool that allows you to look at minimums and maximums um, over your data set. We also have some uh, filters in there that allow you to look at daily minimums, uh, daily maximums, averages per day, those kind of things. Those are included in the in the free version as well as the pro version. So a lot of a lot of flexibility in the software. I, I see there's a question here. Actually, a couple questions came up relative to. Uh, do we have a smartphone app uh, for 
uh, the microstation. And um, uh, at this time, we uh, uh, for the microstation, we do not have um, a smartphone app for the the microstation. We do have other loggers, uh, such as uh, uh, our new uh, MX2300 loggers uh, uh, for outdoor temperature and RH measurements. And we have a smartphone app for those. And uh, I'll, actually, I'll actually be offering a, a webinar on uh, those loggers uh, next Wednesday. So if you're interested in those, uh, please go to our uh, website and uh, register uh, for that webinar, but uh, that's a good good input. And we are definitely moving more and more of our logger software to um, being uh, apps that can run on your smartphones or your, your tablets or other mobile devices because we realize that that uh, uh, is really handy feature. So 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 good input on that. All right, time for me to ask you uh, another question. Just to again get a sense for. Uh, where you're at. So let me see if I can uh, do this right this time. So you can be thinking about what your applications are. And the poll is in progress. Yeah, so just, I know this is a pretty limited set of choices. So I'll look through there, see if there's one that's close to your application, check that box. Um, if you don't see one that's close to your application, there's an other box down here. And for that, you can just um, uh, fill in your application in the questions uh, panel that uh, uh, is part of your control panel. So uh, that's good information for me just to yeah, have a sense for what other applications you're doing. So um, I'll give you a couple more, a few more seconds to fill in your applications. Then I'll share the results. Looks like we've got a good sample in. All right, thanks for your inputs on that. Let me share these results. And as you can see, uh, about half of you are in environmental and climate research, so uh, not no surprise there. A little over a quarter of you are doing agricultural research and some site evaluation and planning, and then 12% in the um, the other category. So yeah, if you get a chance, uh, you know, fill in what those other applications are, just uh, for my curiosity. And let me. Um, Hide these results now, so we can go on to the next slide and come back here. And and I just got some, uh, you know, some typical applications that I think uh, many of you will resonate with. And uh, um, this is uh, environmental and climate research, as about half of you are involved in. Uh, there's some uh, cases. This is applications where our previous microstations have been used. Uh, cause I, I just don't have any pictures of our with our new app, uh, microstation yet. But uh, uh, if you if you get some exciting applications, feel free to share those with us. We always love to see how you're deploying our loggers. Uh, here's uh, one up in the in the mountains. So uh, the uh, research into uh, uh, using seedling shelters to promote reforestation monitoring temperature, humidity, soil moisture, and soil temp up there in the mountains. And yeah, as typical, uh, you set these up in the uh, the summer or the fall, and then you, because you can't get up there uh, during the, the winter. So that's why it's really important to have a nice, robust uh, station uh, that's going to you know survive through a, a harsh winter. So that's why we make them, make them durable. You can see the guy wires here just to keep it stable uh, in the wind conditions up there. That's a pretty, uh, pretty broad uh, base there. I don't think that that tripod's going anywhere. Here's a uh, application right here on Cape Cod. Our, our friends over at Wakoit Bay Research Reserve uh, use uh, our microstations in actually several uh, places around their uh, research uh, center, which is you know tidal estuaries and. Uh, um, and there, in this particular case, they have a station that's looking at rainfall and sediment temperatures in the marshes to, um, um, uh, to you know, to, to monitor how it's responding to, you know, to, to rainfall. 
It's, it's just part of their getting a picture of what's going on within their estuaries. They're doing a lot of research relative to what happens as uh, you know sea level rises. So they're also using like water level loggers and other locations to to look at how uh, these marshes are being affected by uh, sea level rise. Uh, agricultural research, uh, soil moisture, of course, is really uh, big for agricultural research. So this is a site where they were looking at um, uh, soil moisture versus rainfall, optimizing uh, drainage system designs. And um, for site planning, uh, there's a company, Small Vines, that uses them for vineyard site planning. Here's kind of some, you know, mapping examples of, you know, uh, optimizing the uh, uh, selection of, uh, of grape types for different areas of the vineyard uh, and for frost protection and um, obviously you want to uh, have the best match of, uh, of grapes and sites to get your the, the highest quality possible wines so uh, micro stations can be used for that just a smorgasbord of other applications uh, energy research, green roofs, uh, sports turf, greenhouse management. Sometimes people want to, need to monitor outdoor weather conditions during uh, their indoor energy studies, which is also part of our business. So it's nice to have uh, loggers that are supported by the same software that work with both. So, um, so uh, yeah, some ideas to keep in mind for other applications you may have. So, uh, believe it or not, um, I guess yeah, about on time. Uh, I've gotten through uh, the slides that I had prepared in advance, and uh, I've, uh, you've been sending some questions as we've been going along, so I think I've addressed most of those. Um, uh, I would be interested in uh, any other questions you might have, so I'm going to give you a second and uh, also take a second to read. <laughs> I can see some questions have been coming in and let's see. Some interesting applications for energy audits and um, uh, uh, fire detection and uh, where the microstations were buried in PVC cases. Um, Oh, interesting. So, um, so we 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 do actually have loggers that um, uh, are used quite a bit for um, both our standalone loggers as well as some of our station loggers, which are used for uh, uh, pres what we call prescribed burns. Here, where you you burn off uh, the underbrush in an area as a way of uh, kind of managing the uh, the ecosystem there. If you, uh, if you don't burn off the underbrush at a certain time. It can uh, become a very high risk environment, but you want to do it at the, with the right timing. And uh, so a lot of times they want to understand what the temperatures were during that. To, to actually measure them during the, or, or in the area that's being burned, you need uh, something like a thermocouple logger to measure those high temperatures. But um, yeah, that's a, an interesting area. A question about telemetry. Yeah, the microstation itself does not have any provisions for uh, remote communications. If you need some sort of telemetry option, um, then I would recommend you look at our RX3000 systems, which have the uh, option of cellular communication. So anywhere where you can, uh, you have cellular communications. Um, that's uh, we use. Um, uh, you know, supported uh, by a wide range of networks around the world. It's you know, it's GSM or, or 3G uh, cellular that we use. So where you've got 3G coverage, uh, our stations will will work there, and it will automatically push the data up to the internet. And uh, we have a range of data plans, or you can even buy your own SIM. So some good options there for uh, remote uh, monitoring. Heat transfer. Uh, that's a good good question. Do we have a logger for heat transfer? Um, certainly, we do have uh, some people that are using our loggers with temperature sensors, like on insides and outsides of, of walls. 
uh, the looking at heat fluxes across uh, those walls or heat fluxes in soil with temperature measurements at diff different levels. Um, our accuracy of our standard temperature sensors for like the, the, the microstation is 0.2 degrees Celsius. So um, that's something to keep in mind if you're looking at heat flux, you know, is that going to be accurate enough for the heat fluxes you're looking at? Um, if you're looking at heat fluxes across walls, some of our indoor loggers have uh, surface temperature sensors, so you might want to look at those for uh, for temperatures right at the wall surface. We don't have surface temperature sensors for our microstation at this time, so hopefully that gives you some good options. Okay. Just looking through to see what are the questions. Looks like uh, that may be most of your questions. So what I'm going to do um, is uh, kind of go into the next the contact information and basically let's see, I click over here. Here you go. Is I just want to put the offer out there that um, for more information you can certainly go to our website. We uh, provide a wealth of information there, uh, programming demos, programming tutorials, of course all the specifications and pricing are up there. Uh, it's, you'll just find a ton of information on our website. And uh, the next option is calling us. Uh, we have an 800 number, 1-800-LOGGERS, uh, if you want to call us here in the, in the U.S. Um, the, uh, we encourage you to give us a call. We, we have people here to, to take your calls uh, during the normal uh, business hours here in the East Coast of the U.S. Um, we also have a, 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 a number that you can dial in uh, if you're internationally located or contact one of our distributors that's in your region. We usually encourage that if you have a distributor in your region, contact them uh, because they can provide support to you uh, in your region, in your time zone in your language, um, a lot of advantages to, to buying through our local distributors. Um, we also have a, an email uh, address uh, for reaching our sales department or for technical support. Uh, we uh, recommend um, going to our website, and I'll give you the link here. This is our, uh, it's just, a, it, it sends a, an email to our technical support group and it has some of the, the basic qualifying information that w will help them uh, more easily answer your questions. We, we encourage this. You can find a link to this on our website. Um, I see a question here, is the presentation available on the website? What we're going to do is um, we'll send you a link to this recording of this webinar uh, after the, uh, you know, uh, after we're done. So this will, that will go out within the next few days. Um, so watch for that in your email. And I think we'll post uh, a link to this recording on our website as well. So uh, you, you'll always be able to, to find it there. Um, so yeah, the recording will be available in a couple forms. Let's see. At this point, I just want to uh, say a thank you to all of you for attending our webinar today. I've, I've hoped uh, uh, that I've answered your questions. I provided you some information that's going to help you uh, to look at our microstation. And uh, uh, you know, again, as, if you have further questions, uh, just uh, feel free to contact us at any time. So, thank you very much uh, for your attention and for your interest.